My name is Jason from Team Canada, and today I'll be presenting problem number 17, popsicle chain reaction. So to begin, let's analyze the problem state. Wooden popsicle sticks can be joined together by slightly bending each of them so that they interlock in a so-called cobra weak chain. When such a chain has one of its ends released, the sticks rapidly dislodge and a wave run travels along the chain. Investigate the phenomenon. So I'd like to bring your attention to one section, is which is that specifies to use one popsicle stick. So in our experiment, we actually investigate using different materials and kind of plastic so that we can vary the osmosis as well as the dimensions to better understand the phenomenon. So for this problem, there are four parameters we need to consider. The first is the angle the popsicles are arranged when constructing the culvert weave with, with respect to each other. The second is the popsicle spacing, so how closely packed the popsicles are. The third is the material, and therefore the young smallness of the uh, popsicle. And finally, the, ge the geometry or dimension of the, dimensions of the cross-sectional area. So here's an image of a section of a typical culvert weave, um, and here's one with, uh, with a different angle. So to overview of the structure of my presentation, I'll begin with the reproduction of phenomena, followed by an experimental setup. Um, theoretical model where, will, where I'll use energy and wave theory to explain the phenomena. Um, I'll go into key primary interactions and finally conclude with further insects and genetic improvements. So, this is a video of a, um, a typical phenomena occurring as recorded by a camera on the looking track. We can see that the amplitude slowly increases over time until it reaches a steady state, after which there are very small oscillations. The same effect is present for velocity, where it increases up to a steady state. We notice at the very end, well, we notice that the length of the chain um, separate from the cobra, which is part lifted off the ground, is actually very significant. And when it runs out, we notice the weight that can actually be lifted off the ground and rotates in the air. So again, this is an image of a typical cobra weave diagram. And there are two different types of wave fronts that can be created due to the non-symmetry of the cobra weave. The first one you can see on the left is the one shown in the video previous. And this is the second um, possible wave shown, where the sticks are directly lifted up from the chain. So if we were to release the red stick, for example, the, um, the green stick would be lifted directly off the wave, and therefore we would see the sticks just ejecting from the, um, ejecting from the weave. Whereas the blue stick is released, the popsicles are pressing the ground, therefore raising the entire chain, leading, leading to like a wave front we notice in uh, the diagram to the left. So again, uh, I'd like to highlight that there is a wave front, and also there's popsicles attachment, which leads to its propagation. So for our experimental setup, you can see here we use the camera track and a set stepper motor in order to pull the camera um, alongside the chain so we can constantly keep it in the center of frame, therefore reducing parallax and allowing us to view the amplitude over time. We have done back from the top in um, the back. So this is a video of um, the typical setup occurring. So we're able to very consistently adjust the speed of the camera by around two to three meters per second, which is the speed of a possible wave. We also um, experimentally determined the Young's modulus of uh, our different popsicle sticks. We did this by using our, our an Arduino as well as a sealed um, sealed container, and we <coughs> used various uh, temperature probes like thermocouple um, and humidity probes. We can see here. We use a stepper motor to flip the popsicle and observe its frequency. Um, and we use a microphone to record this. Um, and as you can see here, we have a humidifier and dehumidifier to in, um, investigate the effects of humidity. So this is a video of the stepper motor working. We're able to isolate the humidity and temperature inside this um, inside this container, and therefore very accurately obtain the unconscious. So we also use the CNC machine to obtain the uh, plastic popsicle sticks that we used in this, in this experiment. We believe this was very effective because it allowed us to greatly decrease the unconscious and therefore if, um, investigate its influence. We obtained the dimensions and mass of popsicle in comfort digital scale, um, and also on the plastic sticks because. They were uh, slightly thicker. We used tape to increase the amount of friction on the surface, um, which was a six percent, um, which accounted for about six percent of its new mass. So the, here's an image of all the different popsicles, and as you can see, you can see the breadth as well as the depth of the different popsicle sticks. Um, you can very clearly see the different um, thicknesses. These are the experimentally calculated Young's modula, and then here the different lengths. So um, as you, so going from left to right, we have MDF. We have large popsicle sticks, and we attach two of them together so that um, we could actually increase the deflection. Uh, we have PVC, ABS, regular popsicle sticks. We double the thickness by taking two together. And we use regular popsicle sticks, and we also investigate smaller popsicle sticks. For a measurement method, this is a video of a, this is an image of a typical frame um, recorded by our camera. We first apply filters to make this better to track, and we track the amplitude the section where the wave just pulls off the ground to obtain the velocity. We also track the lines of chalk in the background to obtain the velocity of the camera. So knowing the relative velocity between the wave and the camera, we could very accurately predict the velocity of the wave. So the 
because um, this, we use visual analysis, there's actually some room for error because there's a range of acceptable values. As you can see, it's actually quite small, and here the value is shown. So now on to our theoretical model. First of all, it's important to actually be able to calculate the Young's multiply. And we did this by using uh, the free vibration of the template theorem. Uh, we used the euler bernoulli theorem to derive this known equation um, that's shown in the literature. And using this, we be able to very accurately uh, calculate the Young's multiply. So this is an image of a uh, profile of the wave actually obtained experimentally. We set the origin at the section where um, the wave just goes off the ground. And we notice that we can actually observe a radius of curvature for the Cobra weave. So we denote that radius as r, and we denote alpha as the ejection, ejection angle of the sticks from the cobra weave. And notice that in this section of the cobra, the mass inflow, or number of possible sticks entering the cobra, is equal to the mass outflow during steady state. And here's the image of the original, here's the original image. So uh, to solve this problem, we want to focus on efficiency. We want to look at how efficiently elastic potential energy from the reflection is converted into various other, um, <coughs> other energies. So here, uh, again, we use this equation to derive the last potential energy. Um, in this equation, gamma is actually uh, depends on the spin, um, where the possible sticks are actually placed, so whether or not like, the ends are closer or farther apart. Um, and so we are able to derive the different energies they're converted to. The near kinetic one is um, ejected from the power leaf, or the rotational kinetic. So we constantly notice that it's actually rotating away from the polar wheel. Um, as well as gravitational potential. And we took this in the frame um, of the lab. Now we also need to analyze dissipated forces. We notice this is very significant in the energy efficiency. There's inner friction, which basically is the force that um, once you flip a popsicle, leads to it eventually uh, no longer vibrating. So that's the inner friction. There's shear friction, which holds the cobra weave apart and is very significant when the uh, popsicle is actually designed. And also air resistance when they're close to the air. So we're able to calculate the efficiency as follows well using the terms derived previously. Um, and we want to use this term to hopefully derive some constants in order to better understand this phenomenon. Now using mass info, we can also use um, this equation, B equals F, which is analogous to the universal wave equation. So A is the pitch um, of the cobra weave. You can see here the length of the uh, pitch is one third L close theta, where L is the length of a possible stick. Um, and we know that two sticks are actually within this length. So Knowing the velocity as well as the value of the pitch, um, we're able to calculate the frequency, which is the number of sticks that travels through um, the wave or uh, through the cobra, cobra um, in a given second. And our hypothesis is that the frequency is actually actually constant, and the velocity depends entirely on the pitch. Um, and we gain this hypothesis by observing that the deflection, or how much the sticks move, is actually approximately constant. We, use, we numerically determine the actual elastic potential energy using ENSYS, which used Timoshenko beam theory. Um, and we return, obtain that elastic potential of one state is around 0.4756 rules, and we we're able to obtain a much term for that. So, on to key parameters, we vary the angle um, for our different possible states, and this is the following trend. One very interesting thing to note is that the x intercept is actually at 90 degrees, and this is actually um, a ge geometric limitation. Unfortunately, we weren't able to observe uh, increasing angles just because of geometric limitation, so we couldn't actually uh, make popsicles 90 degrees, of course. This was uh, the maximum range we were actually able to reach. And of course, we have the geometric at 90 degrees, where if alpha is 90 degrees, of course, there isn't, this isn't going to be any wave propagation. So we also, therefore, from this, we are able to calculate the number of sticks ejected every second, and we observe that this is around um, 70.226%. Now, of course, looking at the equation of equals that wave, this confirms that the frequency is constant, so we're able to use this um, in our theoretical derivations. Um, we obtained this equation from literature. The one value that we're at, um, that was unclear in the paper was actually be as a function of theta. And, and based on our hypothesis, the com confirmation of our hypothesis that the frequency is approximately constant, um, we, can, we can introduce that uh, E as a function of theta, which is a scaling factor, it's actually one third L plus theta, which is the pitch um, of the cobra weave. Now, once we use this, we're able to fit this to an equation of the velocity as a function of the angle. We added a correction factor of around 0 0.8, uh, 0 0.83, um, and as you can see, it fits 0.12. Um, so therefore, we're giving an equation that can allow us to predict the velocity for any given angle um, for the system of change. Uh, there's the equation, and of course, we have a correction factor. So, 
um, that value, uh, based on the efficiency equation shown previously, was calculated using the radius of curvature. So we matched the firmness with the amplitude. Um, we determined that amplitude was around 0 0.37. So there were some limitations, but this went well with other experimental values. And we also confirmed that amplitude is in fact constant as well. We calculated the efficiency. So this is the, uh, um, the percent of energy dissipated. And we observed that the efficiency of the wave, the amount of elastic potential energy, converted to gravitational velocity <coughs> around around uh, 8%. So we also um, varied, varied the density of the wave. So in this case, we measured the length from end to end. Um, whereas for previous ones, uh, we kept that constant. Uh, and as you can see, by increasing, by putting them closer, we therefore increase the deflection and velocity increases. We varied the thickness as well. So as you can see, uh, the deflection greatly increases when we double the thickness. And in this video, sorry the left one isn't playing, you can actually observe that the amplitude increases. We varied Young's modulus. This is PVC, the Young's modulus is shown below, and that's ABS, it's much lower. They have the exact same dimensions, and as you can see, the wave propagation for the, uh, for, uh, for the PVC is actually much higher. Um, we also graph the amplitude. So in the orange, you see um, wood has a Young's modulus of around 20 gigapascals, and even though we expect Young's modulus to increase the amplitude, we observe that it's actually lower, but we can explain this um, by observing that it's actually possible for the wave to roll over itself. So uh, one of the limitations in literature is that they assume that it's vertical. This is um, what we derive for Young's modulus as a function of relative humidity. We know that it's constantly constant at room humidity. So to include the use of very controlled experiments is to use constants in order to better derive the theory and therefore unexplain the phenomena. And we also use our theoretical model, which uses numerical simulations, to obtain the elastic potential energy as well as explain the phenomena, obtain values like the frequency as well as the velocity and amplitude. These are my references. Thank you for listening. Okay, thank you very much.
My name is Ethan Whitney from Team USA, and I'm opposing problem popsicle chain reaction. So here's the problem statement again. Um, so our criteria for a report, we want to see a strong theoretical and experimental model and find data that shows that the experiment and theory have a strong correlation. Uh, in summer, the Canadian team used the Euler-Bernoulli-Cantilever beam theory, uh, identified a steady state, and utilized uh, conservation and transfer of energy to explain the phenomena solidly uh, and qualitatively. In their experiment, they varied materials, spacing, angle, geometry, and many other factors. Uh, they, re they reduced uh, potential error due to parallax using a moving camera and determined Young's modulus experimentally. Uh, their beta correlation was generally very strong. There were a couple examples of the error bars not fitting, uh, or the theory not fitting within the error bars, but on the whole, the correlation is very strong. Um, so their strengths and weaknesses, very strong theoretical and experimental model. However, as I said, some data was not within their margin of error. Um, they did not have a uh, quantitative uh, or theoretical reason for their circular arc. And their Young's modulus only accounted for the fundamental harmonic, and they did not seem to consider overtones within the cantilever beam. Um, so the points that I would like to go through today are uh, the cantilever beam versus a cantilever plane, and why they may have chosen to uh, call the popsicle stick a beam rather than a plane. I would also like to talk about the deviation in the data, as like I said, sometimes their error bars uh, were varied in size significantly. I'd like to know where the error bars came from and why there were some deviations in data compared to the theory. I'd also like to talk about the Young's modulus and why they use that alpha value for the fundamental when it's quite possible and even likely that there are some overtones present within the popsicle sticks. And finally, uh, I'd like, to, I'd like to briefly talk about how they uh, measured for a constant angle. And finally, I'd like to discuss some boundary cases if we have the time. OK. And this up. Okay. So, so, so again, I'd like to clear up um, information about the fundamental. So we actually um, created a Fourier transform. We observed that the fundamental was the highest peak for the frequency. And for more of the equation we use for cathode beam, 1.875 squared is a constant um, that's dependent on the fundamental. Yes. Um, so we're actually agree, uh, right? And as you can see in the video, you can very clearly see that it is actually fundamental. So we don't actually notice like two curves, for example, it's okay. Right. Okay. Uh, so yes, yeah, so I understand so that's that's fine. Um, so the first point I would like to talk about is uh, why you chose to use a cantilever uh, beam versus a plane. Did you back, go back to where you had a top-down view of all of your popsicle sticks, please? There was an image where you took a picture of all the sticks. Uh, no, 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 I mean where you had each different kind of popsicle stick. Oh, okay. Yes, that was what I was looking for. Popsicle sticks, you measured the length. Did you also measure the width of your popsicle sticks at any point? Um, thank you. So, was the ratio of the length to width uh, greater than or less than 10? Uh, okay, just okay, a simple the office of observation, I see the ratio is less than 10. Okay. Why then did you choose to model this as a cantilever beam? There's a difference. Planes are two dimensional, so we use a beam. The popsicle has the characteristic of the science of beam. And furthermore, we actually take like the thickness into account. We don't make any assumptions. It's included in the theory. So then, uh, if you were okay, so then, did you include shear deformation in your model of? Yes, the Francis um, uses Tilly shankle. So unlike the Euler um it accounts for shearing, um, and therefore we right, yeah. So Tilly shankle um, accounts for shearing. Did you have any uh, any possible sticks where the ratio of uh, length to width was less than four? And if, and if so, did you use any? Plane theory to explain the phenomena with them. We did not. Just plane theory. Plane theory is inaccurate. Okay. Thank you. Um, then can we go to the data? I'd like to ask why some of the error bars, specifically in like slide 26 and a couple after, had such variation and where those variations came from. So, for example, some of your error bars are quite large and others are quite small. Uh, why is there such a difference in the error bars between data points? So we couldn't guarantee that our error was consistent around the house. So within our different trials, the errors, of course, were different because we obtained values of some systematic error. 
for random data. Okay. So what I mean, what, so for example, between the first and second data point, what was the primary cause for one being very accurate, one being rather or comparatively inaccurate? Okay. So within our experiments, we had so we calculated the standard deviation across three different videos. In each in each video, I'm showing a different technique we use to actually track it. So there are going to be some like slight variations, like perhaps the possible chain is slightly to the right in the frame, or right. There are always going to be very small errors within measurement. And I've also shown you the range of acceptable values when actually calculating the velocity, or calculating the speed of the camera itself. Okay, thank you. Um, so then why in this graph and a couple other graphs, uh, how do you explain some of the data points where the error bars do not uh, go in, do not uh, actually reach your theory? For the error bars, like for example, your fourth data point does not fall within your theoretical model. So of course we couldn't perfect the experiment. We can't create a perfect experiment. That's the reason why we have error bars in the first place. But these very small differences, I believe, are insignificant in determining the validity of this data. Um, okay, thank you. Like there's um, no way to guarantee it's always going to possible. We go. We go. Help me. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, all right. And then let me uh, now return to my third point, which was uh, the Young's modulus one more time. So I, I understand that you said the fundamental was the largest. Did you observe that the fundamental was the largest frequency merely by observing the camera footage, or did you have any other methods? We created a Fourier transform. We didn't add So did you record using the microphone? Right, we did. Okay. Do you have a graph of your Fourier transform? So I mean, I understand what a Fourier transform is. I'm asking them, do you have an actual graph where you showed that one peak was higher than any of the other over two? No, I, I understand that that's what it would look like. I'm asking, did you actually measure it and put it into your presentation at any point? No, it's not. Okay, um, so then, even, so even still, if this is a big approximation, do you not think that it would be worthwhile to include this? Uh, so I'd like to ask you why you believe it's important to consider something other than the fundamental. What what makes you believe that Young's modulus would be different? Because the, the alpha value for the Young's modulus varies depending on which overturn that you're using. Yeah, so, so you have to consider not only the fundamental, but also the overturns that account for the Young's. And we'd obtain the same Young's modulus because the constant scales. So since the frequency scales, the constant alpha also scales. And because of this, we'd obtain the same Young's modulus. But because this was the largest peak, and because we saw in the video this was the most clear overturn, we see no reason to use any other value because that would only increase our error. This, because this is clearly the largest peak in our experiment. Okay. Um, and so then, uh, I will just uh, to briefly uh, ask about your experimental method. So, for example, the angular uh, the experiment where you vary the angle. Um, what measuring tool did? How did you make sure that each angle was the same angle? We used the image shape and cut um, and measured five different time steps within the video. So in each video, we took a screenshot during the steady state, um, and using image J, we were able to construct. Um, a, we were able to construct an image very similar to the one I showed you for our coordinate system, and therefore we were able to obtain uh, alpha. Um, so within your image data, did you account for any parallax if you're only taking one image of the setup, or did you stitch? We one? took a range, so we took multiple different time steps, and therefore that. Um, and furthermore, because the camera is actually not that close to the pulse screen, it's quite far. And also because the difference is essentially like within our video, you can see the difference perhaps is like two, like ten centimeters, perhaps at most. So parallax is very, very much. Um, then can I talk about the angle boundary conditions? So, uh, for example, you said as it goes to ninety degrees, uh, your graph will tend towards zero when you're varying the angle. Uh, you had you had a graph, I believe, where the slope was going downwards, and as your angle approached ninety degrees, uh, the graph was approaching zero. If you could hear it, it goes to 90 degrees, of course. Yes. Um, so what value does this approach as uh, the angle goes towards zero? And then okay, do you so have any theory? Do you, know what alpha, do you know what alpha is, right? Yes, the other okay. module's constant. So if the pulse of 6 right this, okay. Yes. This is our value for alpha. If it's equal to 90 degrees, then all the pulse of 6 are going to be on one point, where each, like, they're all on one point, right? So okay. this is 90 degrees. So, uh, yeah, the velocity would be zero. This oh, I mean, no, I meant, like, as the angle approaches zero, is there a specific like, value of maximum velocity? You no, know, this depends on the property of the chain itself, the wind pops with things. Okay, well, 
So like this, so this is a is this a best fit line or is this a this is the best fit line? Okay, do you have any theoretical model that that matches this data or did you just simply try the best fit it? We use these values to empirically de derive an equation that fits for all different angles given um same same obstacles. So for varying angles, if you only had empiric data, you had no real theory behind how angle would affect velocity. We use this to construct the theory. Do you okay. But there was what I'm saying is all, all of this is based on simply empiric data and you have no real physics behind how angle would affect. We have qualitative explanations as well as hypothesis that make us believe that so you can you give me a qualitative explanation for why the triangle would be linear? So we experimentally determined that the frequency is approximately constant. The number of sticks being ejected every single second is constant. And therefore, we can expect that the velocity of the wave only depends on the x component of its length. Basically, how long it is. So, for example, for a very small angle, this value is much larger. So given the same frequency, of course the velocity is going to be much higher. Okay. So you're suggesting that the change in velocity is only approaches to its change in x time? Yes. You do not think that there's any additional or less uh, potential um, I'm sorry, uh, potential energy stored by this, depending on the angle? We're experimenting to determine that this is true. So, this, so for example, if there was a shorter angle, there would be more or less potential energy than this field? Or, or do you think that these two... One of our hypotheses is that the reason this occurs is that potential energy is constant, regardless of the angle. Okay, thank you. Um, and then finally, uh, can we talk about... Um, Okay, so here's another example of a graph. So, why is why exactly is the frequency here 70? Do you have any this, do you have any theory behind why this graph is 70? Like you'd like why, to explain why, why popsicle sticks are ejected? No, no, no. I'm saying why is the frequency here like 70 degrees in specific? What's so special about the number 70 besides we observed the number 70? 70 is not a unique number. If we use slightly different popsicle sticks, maybe we get 60. Maybe we get 80. So, this, so 70 degrees is only, or I'm sorry, 70 hertz is only specific to one kind of popsicle stick. Yes. So then, if you vary the popsicle sticks, how would the max, how would this frequency change? Do you so, for example, if we use, you can tell. Okay. For popsicle sticks with higher young modulus, or perhaps popsicle sticks um, with a higher thickness, we know that the flexion is going to increase, and therefore the force, the force ejecting the popsicle sticks from the chain, is going to increase. And with an increase of the force, we'd expect more popsicle sticks to be ejected every single second. Okay, thank you. Um, so then, finally, I just uh, one more time. I'm not. I'm. I'm just not un entirely understanding why you keep basing everything on Young's modulus if your length to width ratio, ratio is not greater than ten. Because it's, why? Because it, it's well known that Young's modulus applies for beams where the length is at least ten times that of the width. They're saying this Young's modulus so what is the material. Doing? It doesn't matter what the beam is. Well, it could be a square and it's still only able modulus. to apply the same modulus to beam theory if the length of width ratio is greater than 10. Can you explain why? Qualitatively. Qualitatively, it is because when it's less than when it's less than 10. Basically, how would it like you can see the thickness? Why would an order of magnitude of an arbitrary value, like as you say 10, make this beam become a plane? I'm, I'm just basically what happens is it only we only apply plane theory when it's less than four. It's just, it's simply known in engineering and other literature that generally speaking ten is the widely considered threshold for using polar theory. Ten is not a magic number. It's simply what's been widely agreed upon by the engineer. Why? Explain why. Very really short. What? Short. You can shortly reply. Explain why you believe this is true. So that's simple. I personally so have no clue why they chose ten. Okay, I have a clue why they chose ten. Okay, I'm going to set up the time for the discussion. <coughs> and now one thing to surprise. Okay, in conclusion, um, we are very impressed with their presentation. They had a very solid uh, experimental and theoretic model. They varied many parameters, including, um, as we said, uh, the, uh, the, the material used, the spacing, the angle, and the geometry of their setup. Um, they also uh, very even more uh, parameters such as humidity. Uh, their data generally lined up. There were a couple discrepancies. Uh, however, we realized that uh, their model was primarily and their and their uh, space, their model was primarily uh, only used for a couple parameters, whereas many were actually 
uh, just used to determine best fit lines to determine an empiric model, whereas they had no theory behind it, which we would have hoped for some more theory behind a couple of the graphs. Um, overall, a very solid presentation. However, we would have liked to see more theory behind a couple of the parameters.
have a good day. Everyone, I'm Noel Shmatosh from Immigration. Today I'll be reviewing uh, problem number 17, how to change the action. So uh, the problem next to the record quite tough, so I'll just quickly skip it. And uh, regarding the theory of the community, they know that the asymmetry is one of the important things of whether the six are ejected up or down. And they use uh, the appropriate euler Bernoulli here to model elastic energy with them. Uh, they considered all relevant energies such as the rotation, uh, the movement, and the rotational potential energy, and that's good. But uh, they didn't have considerations of the boundary conditions such as the gravity, aka when the phenomenon will not actually happen due to the elastic energy not being enough to lift it off the ground. And the breaking point, for example, if I take this I have a stick and break it, I have certain tension before it breaks. So you could have a very short stick and it would break if you met it. Um, also there the explanation of propulsion once it separates all the ground was somewhat weak. Um, but good in clarification. Uh, the experiment was consistent and well made. Uh, amazing precision, German engineering nearly. Uh, the experimental of uh, Young's, uh, the Young model was determined with the valid method commonly used, uh, and many relevant variables were considered. Uh, you stated the friction of the sport, you didn't really conserve the surface, but that's fine, it's at least, it's uh, empirically explained, it's good. Uh, regarding your results and conclusion, uh, you obtained low errors in measurement, and I consider those good. You have a comparison good fit between like your theory, your sort of expectation and the data, and you even observed a new phenomenon that is in addition to the pr uh, previous research and literature of it actually being a circular arc, arc compared to what others observed previously. Uh, uh, still the same kind of a boundary condition and uh, so, uh, this should be for a second slide uh, the other point um, now to the opponent uh, you clarified methods uh, used to relevant questions at the beginning but you spent a lot of time uh, on irrelevant points such as error bars and you missed the point of boundary condition which would be nice to notice and the previous point of you didn't really say your own opinion uh, now to the most important part, the discussion. Uh, so regarding fundamental uh, frequency uh, data, not Dana, uh, we agree with the reporter that the fundamental frequency is valid for calculating because the literature uses it as well, and it's all fine and good. Uh, the beam versus plane, we consider the beam theory uh, adequate, and if you would use something more advanced, you would probably use a plane, not plane theory. For that, regarding error bars, I should have removed the pattern, but it's, yeah, it was completely irrelevant uh, because error bars. Uh, regarding the measurement of angles, uh, there were some good points there uh, because there is a line fit for certain angles, but for other angles such as zero, it's geometrically impossible to set up like that. So it'd be interesting to see what happens if you somehow manage to construct it going towards those angles and going towards the 90 degrees, because I'm expecting that as it goes towards 90 degrees, the velocity would actually, I mean, in a very theoretical, geometrical mode that's impossible, increase because it has like more rejections and stuff, but that's something that's physically impossible. So, okay. And regarding the efficiency, uh, the opponent noticed the, the, fre the frequency as the component of efficiency, and uh, I consider that the efficiency measurement was good, especially compared to literature. So, uh, to wrap up, the best points were breaking uh, point and gravitational limit. Neither mentioned the concentration of momentum until clarification from the reporting, for which I thank. And there was uh, the weak consideration of boundary conditions of angle of 6. Thank you very much for your attention. So, there are several clarified points I want to make. First, uh, due to the reason we actually had to use um, data to obtain the fit, is because of the actually highly complex dynamics of the system, making it very difficult for us to actually derive a purely theoretical model, and therefore we resolved to derive a theoretical model with empirically fit functions and hopefully a very accurate um, experimental procedures. And by hypothesizing that our system requires an activation energy or an efficiency at the steady state, um, we developed the model and therefore we're able to very accurately predict the model's velocity using this equation. Um, and also, unfortunately, in this equation, you may notice that there are no error bars. This was because we had to switch to computers at the last minute, and those weren't added in yet. Um, also, on your point, point on the breaking point, whether or not it's actually raised, we, um, we observed this effect because for our largest popsicle sticks, 
um, the mass was actually very high, and because they were very long, the deflections were small, and no matter what we did, the POSCO 6 wouldn't actually raise up, and therefore the mass and therefore gravity is what's holding it to the ground and what may prevent it. And that's why we doubled the thickness so the deflection would increase. Um, also on your point that we didn't add our own opinion, the entire activation... No, 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 no. What are your point? I'm sorry. Okay. Right. Oh, in that case, sorry. Thank you. Um, and when it comes to um, approaching like perhaps 90 degrees, we're actually constructing the chains. Um, when we were using the popsicles, we, tr we made our best attempt to actually increase the angle significantly, but there is actually a geometric limit. Like once you start constructing the popsicle sticks, either it's impossible to bend it like very much when the angle increases a lot, or the sliding is so much that it slips immediately. <coughs> so we were able to obtain data, but just looking at our theoretical line, we believe the few points we do have are able to accurately so I'd like to thank, thank the opponent of viewer for this discussion, um, and thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Questions? Yes, yeah. uh, So this is already the correct slide up, uh, uh, you introduced this correction factor, which is uh, really large, actually, about 20%. Could you elaborate on that a little bit? More, maybe explain where it comes from. What could be the reason that this is needed? So, using this equation, we weren't able to completely like um, we weren't able to consider every single aspect that could be changed, um, changed for the chain. So, for example, here um, the young spot is divided by the mass density. It's a speed of wave, and the overall depends on the geometry. But this equation um, doesn't depend on the wind. Um, so although we, theoretically, this is um, a minor effect, when actually constructing the chain, the width does provide some limits when, um, when constructing it. And furthermore, there are some, there's some effects we might be able to consider, like for example, um, error in measurement, or like if the angle wasn't perfectly circular, then we wouldn't be able to determine like a perfectly accurate gradient curve. So we did have to fit it um, in order to obtain this equation. Okay. Thank you. Do you have photos? Uh, 